Okay, record it now. Yes. <laughs> I'm also the presenter. It's like, that would be the moment. Heidi, thank you so much for the package. I've been so busy. I haven't yet opened it, but it's sitting right. There. I just like I can't I wait for you to open it. There's so many goodies in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Amy, send me your address and then I'm I'll pissed. show you some good stuff. All right. You know what's funny? So Heidi's messaging on uh, botanical colors on, <laughs> and she thinks I'm you. And I'm like, what is even going on? Did you Heidi give better? her a present and you didn't give me one? Is that what you were saying? <laughs> I totally That's what I got said. I'm like, you, you're up Shit's Creek. <laughs> Take a class next year and you're supposed to know how to embroider. And, and, and uh, that was my like second grade, you know, after school thing. So it's yeah. been a while. Let's just say it that way. Oh, well, I... I'll, I'm going to send you, uh, I'll send you my address too, Heidi. Just throw some eucalyptus leaves and bark in there. I will. Oh, I will. I just lost image. Crap. Oh, oh. We're here. We're here. I'm going to lose all kinds of things today. What? I kind of lost my mind. I lost my mind. All right. Yes. <laughs> Are we in? <laughs> Oh, if you guys only knew the background of the you background. You could just see the rest of this studio. You would run. You screaming. could just screaming. see. Oh, day. <laughs> it's TGIF though. Garbage okay. Day. All right. Start the music. All right. Are you going to let these folks in? Uh, let me find them. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where's the dance I'm, on, I'm just ready. on the verge of a laugh Michelle. attack. Go for it. Yes. I'm on the Boogie verge down of a laugh. Friday. Attack. Let's go. Let's do. <laughs> oh my God. Let's hope that this song goes right because it was playing another song earlier. That's all right. All right. <laughs> Stop making me laugh, Kathy. Hold on. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday. So come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Well, that was totally inspiring. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jimmy. Amy, I'm moving the admits back to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I didn't have my headset on. I was trying to figure out why the sound sounded so strange, but now it's perfect. Hello, and welcome to Feedback Friday, episode 66. Oh, my goodness, 66. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Woo, 66. Yes. Yes. How are you, everyone? We're a little crazy today, but we're going to do our best. Uh, Feedback Friday is Botanical Colors weekly show where we speak with artists, scholars, dyers, growers, activists, all sorts of amazing people, historians who are interested in what we're interested, which is natural dyes and textiles. And so uh, we are really pleased that we have a special program today. Um, you all know me, I'm Kathy Hottori, president of Botanical Colors and joining me is Amy Dufo from the beautiful Cape. Uh, and it's raining here in Seattle, thank goodness. It's been a while and there's been a lot of fires. So we're really happy for the precipitation. Um, today we are going to have, hey, it's me. I, wait a minute, I am the presenter. <laughs> I'm making Amy laugh. This is all staged. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's me and I'm going to be talking about an interesting dye that we've just um, got in. It's called um, Cherry Ops Tagal. And uh, I did a little research on it and was able to find out that the kingdom of Brunei used to be like the world's largest producer of this before it became a really important um, petroleum um, com country. So super interesting. Um, before we start, I do want to say thank you to everybody. 
it has been a ride. I know a lot of you are might be in areas where um, you thought coronavirus was over, but it actually isn't. <laughs> and that's been a little bit of a um, kind of a little deflating. But remember, mask up, be kind to people. We'll get through this. We thought it was over, but it's not. So we're just going to keep going. A couple of more months of mask wearing isn't going to kill anybody. So, and if for some reason, if vaccines weren't your thing, just, just think about maybe making it your thing, but it's totally up to you. All right, um, Amy's going to moderate. She's going to look at chat. And once uh, I'm done with my presentation, we will be opening it up for questions and I will do my very, very best to answer. And uh, we're going to have everyone muted for the presentation, but uh, after we'll open it up and everyone can say hi and bye. Um, I just wanted to let you know that most likely we're going to go just between 45 and 55 minutes today. Um, I have like a, another thing going right afterwards, so I got to get ready for that. And um, but but we will be returning with an amazing presenter. So I'll speak to, uh, about that at the end of the session. All right. So now we're just going to turn it over to our guest, Kathy Hattori. Oh, thank you. It's so happy to be here. And thank you, Amy, for letting me present. OK, I'm going to try to do my little uh, share screen here and go through what I learned about Cheriops Tagal. It's pretty interesting. Uh, whoops, I don't have it. Hold on. You know, you'd think after all 66 sessions, we would have, oh, I know why. I was just on the wrong screen. All right, here we are. Uh, one moment. Amy, it's your turn to like be talking. Oh, there we go. I was just, I, I was ready if you needed me. Yeah, I, I need you for sure. Okay. Kathy again. Oh, yes. Six Finally six got it going. Go. Okay, Let's great. See, I'm going to hit the present button. This is Google Slides. I hope it doesn't go ahead of me. Um, so my presentation today is talking about Cherry Ops Tagal. It's an FSC certified dye from Threads of Life. Um, for those of you, I'm just going to, let's see. No, 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 no. Okay, good. Um, whoops, it's doing it. I just need to chit chat here. Let's see, stop. What happens if I hit stop presenting? Oh, that doesn't work. Oh, well, I'm going from here. Okay, so just wanted to give you a little bit of background. So um, Threads of Life, who presented a few weeks ago and had that amazing trunk show of incredible indigenous textiles from the many, many different communities and islands uh, of Indonesia, uh, also has a few dyes that they sell. And one of them is Cheriops Tagal. And a long time ago, somebody emailed me and said, would you please carry this dye? And I didn't even know what it was. So I just said, sure. And then didn't think anything else of it. But when we were speaking to uh, William and Jean, they just talked a little bit about uh, some of the things that they still had to offer. And so uh, Cherry Ops was one of them. And I said, oh, sure, let's buy some. So we bought some. We, bought, we actually bought a lot. We have a lot now. <laughs> We're not going to run out anytime soon. But uh, in, because I didn't know anything about it, I had to do a little bit of background. And William sent me the instructions, which everyone who buys it will have that online so that you can also embark on this amazing journey of creating your own Cherry Ops Tagal dye. So that's kind of the backstory of it. And then I just wanted to go through a little bit about the plant itself, a little bit about mangroves and the uh, challenges that we are seeing with mangrove forests all over the world. And this um, issue of maritime development and the threatened, um, the threatened ecosystems and how this is being addressed by the group that is creating this die. So uh, let's go to present now and let's hope it works. Yes, I gotta hit that little arrow and um, hold on a second, autoplay every, I was gonna say every minute, that way I have a little bit of time to, oops, talk. All right, so Cherry Ops Tagal, what is it? It's a, it's a mangrove, it's a mangrove tree. And this is the, um, these are the maritime tropical forests of the world. They're 
absolutely vital to healthy marine ecosystems because they serve as the interface between the shore and the, the sea, and they create this type of break. So they prevent um, the type of erosion from high tides. They absolutely have uh, a way because their root structure is so um, intricate that they they're you know that they're like nurseries for different types of uh, types of marine life, and they also provide livelihood for uh, communities. So they consist of several species. They're salt tolerant, and they're in this intertidal zone that's in on the shore, swamps, bays, lagoons, estuaries, etc. Um, there are, where did I see mangroves that surprised me? There's mangroves in Florida, that's what it was. So um, they're also under threat. So, you know, they're everywhere on pretty much every, um, you know, tropical continent and they need to be protected and um, respected for what, they, what their role is. They were considered an inexhaustible resource because they reseed and grow very easily. But of course, human intervention and uh, clear cutting has far exceeded their ability to um, reproduce and they're they're creating fisheries, shrimp farming, salt pans and other types of development. So management of the mangrove forest is absolutely critical for the health and long term survival of this very, very important part of our ecosystem. Oh, yeah, so this is what a mangrove uh, on the shore looks like, as you can see, it has this incredible branching system uh, of taking nutrients from this saline, very muddy, very wet uh, environment. And you can imagine just in situations where there's either high tide or a storm that um, this would be a very, very important part of maintaining shore health and protecting the shoreline. So the habitat of the mangrove, um, it's found in Southeast Asia, the Eastern Africa, African coast, um, extensively through Philippines, Indonesia, Pacific Island nations, and parts of Northeast Australia, and as I mentioned, parts of Florida. Uh, Threads of Life gets their cherry ops dye from the Forest Stewardship Council. And I'm sure you've seen FSC certified um, paper products that are available to us as consumers here in the US. Um, they, FSC is all over the world. They are working with private companies who have the rights to use um, forested areas to be, uh, be able to log them, use the wood products, etc. And they're really laying on top of that a set of standards that the company has to agree to that not only preserves um, sustainable economic development, meaning no clear cutting, but also that it, it benefits any indigenous or local economies. It also um, looks at environmental impacts in order to preserve any type of uh, and, and protect wildlife, etc. So they try really hard to work with a private company who's, of course, their motivation is to get as much uh, profit out of this piece of land as, as quickly as possible. But FSC has a completely different uh, philosophy in that, no, you have to look at that as stewardship as opposed to just profit. Um, so mangrove as a product is quite desirable. It's a very hard, fairly straight wood, so it's good for timber. Um, it's been used to create, uh, make charcoal, it's very prized for that because it burns very hot. Um, and so, you know, it's it, it and there, because it was so extensive, it was an easy product just to clear cut and uh, oh. exploit. Um, the bark, which is what is used for this dye, can, uh, may contain between 23 to 40% tannin. And the way that they use it is that um, the, the mill will take the wood they leave the bark and then the bark is then boiled into a thick syrup, which is then dried. It's, um, it's a byproduct. And so then the bark is then um, collected by village groups around the area of the mangrove logging area and they process it into the dye. And uh, in Java, which, which is where part of this happens, whoops, um, it's called tingi. Tingi or tingi. I don't, I don't speak this language, so I don't know, but it's pretty 
uh, it has mer a myriad of different names depending on the country where it's being um, created. And in all cases, every culture is using the bark. Um, here's another view of the uh, mangrove forest and these creatures that are flying above it are flying foxes. So I thought that was just so fascinating. I mean, look at this is their habitat. It's just amazing. I mean, definitely once it's, um, it's open to travel again, this is a place that we have got to go. It's just incredible. So some of the unique features of cherry ops as a dye, um, traditionally they were used, the dye was used to soak uh, cotton fishing nets or sails or any type of rope that were used in the fishing um, industry because it added strength to the life of the, the fabrics. And any of you who are have done traditional like katazome, where you take a piece of, of paper, handmade paper, and you soak it in persimmon dye, which is also super high in tannin, know that it helps strengthen the paper. So the, this high tannin dye is really good for sort of reinforcing um, the strength of cotton, which is a very strong fiber, but sometimes can weaken with exposure to salt water. So this is really interesting how they figured that out. It's also used as an herbal medicine for stomach ailments, um, ulcers. Also, it's used um, in villages where they do traditional medicine to treat diabetes. Um, and there is a color that comes from it that in traditional batik, it's called solga brown. And it's a, a, a plant called solga as well as cherry ops that are combined to create this really amazing rich rich brown that if you ha have ever seen the brownish really intricate javanese batik work and that beautiful rich 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 cinnamony brown that is part of what cherry ops um, color comes out after multiple dips i want to kind of move to like how this plant re recreates itself it's pretty amazing so the seed pod is this beautiful long narrow um like dart shape or dagger shape. And while it is still attached to the tree, it actually starts to germinate and grow roots. And so when it's ready to um, drop from the tree, it has a root structure already established. And so what the seedlings, what will happen is that the seedling will burrow upright in the silty mud below where it's hanging and then it anchors itself against the currents because it already has this root structure. The other thing is that it can grow up to 60 centimeters uh, in 24 hours. And so I was doing that, you know, metric to inches conversion, trying to figure out what 60 centimeters was. And I put in six centimeters and it was like 2.4 inches. And I thought, oh yeah, that's okay. That's pretty good. But, you know, since it burrows in maybe two to three feet or a meter into the soil, you know, below the surface of the water, I thought, oh, it's got to really have a pretty strong um, constitution to be in water that long before it actually can surface and start to uh, sprout leaves and do photosynthesis. But then I realized my, my conversion was incorrect and it's actually 60 centimeters, which is 24 inches or two feet. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I don't know any other plant that grows two feet in 24 hours unless maybe it's kudzu or um, maybe some of the bamboo. So that was amazing. And I have a series of images on what this process looks like. Okay, so here is the seed pod and it is pre, I think it's pre rooting, but this might actually be the roots. I couldn't quite tell, but I don't know how it would flip over in order to get that into the ground. But anyway, that is the dagger-like, dart-like shape of the seed pod. And then here it is burrowed. Can you see? It's just like standing upright in on the bottom of this um, water, watery ocean floor by the shore. And there's all this kind of stuff on the ground that I'm sure are on in the under the water, which is providing nutrients to it. And it's standing upright, which I thought was just super amazing. 
And then look at that. I mean, these things are just like coming straight up. So it's grown and now it's leafing out and able to do photosynthesis and get the nutrients from um, carbon dioxide and sunlight and do its whole cycle in order to grow into a healthy cherryops tree. And there are many areas where it is being reforested. And I found some photos where there's whole villages and whole organizations that are taking these seed pods and just putting them into the water in a pretty like regular pattern in order to regrow areas that have been um, either deforested or perhaps damaged through some sort of um, human environmental actions. So, and I also found, I'll try to find the reference for it, uh, a newsletter that showed like 10 different um, places where within the Indonesian islands, different village groups were working to preserve their infrastructure and their environmental um, capabilities and kind of pushing back against a lot of development. Not all of it was cherry ops. In fact, only part of it was, but uh, I feel like this, the idea of activism in Indonesia amongst villagers, it's not, I mean, it's definitely been around and it's starting to great, gain traction because I think they're seeing that there are so many um, threats to their way of life and their way of living. So that was super interesting. So um, cherry ops as a dye stuff is different than what we typically do with dye stuffs. Although many of you are now creating pigments and reusing dye baths and doing all sorts of creative um, things with a dye bath after you've done, you're done dyeing with it. But with cherry ops as a dye stuff, you don't even throw it away ever. So what they do is they create a, a cherry ops solution by boiling the extract, which I'll show you a picture of it later in this presentation. And then they let it age for about a month covered. So it's not, it's not an instant ramen kind of um, dye here. It takes a little bit of while, a little while. And you can work either from the bark preparation or from an extract. Because we have an, uh, a product that is being imported from Indonesia, we are only able to get ac extract. We can't get raw bark because of um, export restrictions, both in Indonesia and import restrictions in the United States. So we're using the extract and it still is boiled and they use a copper pot because copper helps um, bring out reds. So if any of you have ever done any type of uh, dyeing with either in a copper pot or put copper into your dye bath, like a, like lac or matter or um, uh, cochineal, you'll see that the red gets kind of redder. And with cherry ups, because it, the tannin in it is considered a red tannin, that you do see like you get a much deeper color than if you didn't use copper. Now, when I'm talking about copper, I'm talking about a piece of copper, like a small piece of copper pipe. I looked um, on the Lowe's website and you can buy like a little copper uh, connector pipe for about anywhere from two to five dollars. So they're not super expensive. You can use them over and over and over again. If you have copper scraps, you can use those. Um, you used to be able to use copper pennies, but those are now a mixed metal. So I don't know how well those work, but I'm not talking about copper sulfate, which is uh, considered a poisonous um, mordant. So I'm talking about copper metal that you would actually put into the dye pot. Or you, if you do have a copper pot, use a copper pot. Um, and so this helps develop the color. And then it's, it's then allowed to age for about a month. Uh, and so you would put it like in a plastic tub with a lid on it, put a date on it, leave it cool, and then wait for a month. So, you know, while you're waiting, you can get your threads prepared or your fabric prepare, prepared and then um, proceed to dyeing. Then when you want to dye with it, what you're doing is you're actually just taking some of that liquid, putting it into um, a, dye, a, a dye pot, heating it then straining it and cooling it again. So the dye process where you're actually putting the fiber into the dye is a cold process. You 
excuse me, you can use either mordanted or unmordanted uh, fibers because it's a tannin, it's very heavy in tannin, you know, up to 40% tannin. And then you put it into the cherry ops you um, bring it out, you wring it out, you open it up. You don't really need to oxidize it per se, but you definitely wanna just let it air for a little bit and then you can put it back in. And then you do that multiple times until you get the depth of shade that you want. Um, what William says in the instruction is, is that they're basically using about 18% weight of fiber to get the colors that they want, but you can use you know, up as much or as little as you want, but just know that your shades will be either lighter or darker, depending on how much cherry ops you use. Then once you're done with this dip process, you just put the excess liquid back to your storage pot, cover it and store it again until your next um, dye session. And if the volume starts to get low and you do start to eventually use it up, you, you just boil up more cherry ops and add it to, to your pot or you can have two pots and have one that's aging and in the process and have one that you're using and then just keep combining them so that you are always ready if you fall in love with this dye color, which I think you will because it's pretty amazing. So it's real simple. And I love the way that it's not something where you have a huge pot of water, you're adding the extract in and then you know, you're know you just throwing it away. You're saving it. And apparently they save it for a long time. So. I didn't get any information that they ever really discard it. Um, you may get something like some, you know, mold on the surface of it if you're storing it for a long period of time. We typically deal with that by uh, putting a little bit of essential oil, such as oil of clove, oregano oil, thyme oil, something like that, which is uh, antimicrobial. So here's a picture of them dipping into cherry ops tubs. So they've got a, a number of different black plastic tubs that are filled with the cherry ops dye. Obviously, for this size of fabric, they are using a lot of cherry ops, right? Probably a, a couple of kilos that they're using in order to create these colors. But they're doing lots and lots of fabric at a time. And then they're saving as much of the drips as they can. And then they'll restore it back into the um, cherry ops storage vat when they're done. And they do multiple dips. I don't know. I have a piece of cherry ops fabric behind me. I don't know how many dips it was, but it is a super, it almost is the same color as Amy's um, blouse, which might be matter, but it's it's a it's a but it has a more of a brown tone. I'll bring it closer to the screen uh, when we're done. And these photos are from the Threads of Life um, website. Let's see if I can go to, oh, sorry. Oh, well, wait, this one is the one. So um, those of you who were just recently in Abu Bakar Fofana's uh, mineral mud dyeing workshop, this is another part of the world where they're doing uh, mud dyeing. And so um, as we learned in his workshop, mud dyeing is a combination of a very strong tannin then and then also um, dipped in, painted on, or immersed in iron-rich mud. And so this is the same process. And there's a similar process in Japan. Uh, it's called dorozome. Um, that's also a mud dye process. And so as you can see, people all over the world have figured out that if they took a tannin and then put it into mud, they would get a beautiful dark gray, black um, color. And of course, the shade again is a function of how many, how much tannin is on the fiber, and then how rich is the iron mud. And I'm going to go back uh, a slide. And this is one of the villagers um, who is, you can see, she is dipping a skein of yarn into mud. So the skein had. Um, cherry ops on it. And those, I think those little white areas that are on the skein might be actual resist ties because they do a lot of um, ecot. As you can see by her skirt, they do uh, an ecot kind of um, design. And so she's just dipping it, re-dipping it. And, and they have their mud areas that are just kind of protected and they have to wait until the uh, rainy season for the mud to get recharged and then they kind of wait. They might do some augmenting of it by using some rice water 
Um, and when I say rice water, I mean the milky water that's left after you wash rice. They may add it into this mud puddle here and help with fermentation and then proceed to doing their dipping. Um, when we were in the mineral mud class, we were talking about using a uh, wheat bran milk uh, in order to create fermentation with mud. Um, I know that I found uh, iron rich mud when I was in Alaska. It, and the thing that you're looking for when you're looking for iron rich mud is it's got this kind of grayish cast. Can you see that the mud, the muddy water she's in is actually gray and it's not brown or reddish um, the way that we think of iron rich being, it's, it's grayish. And so when you see that grayish shade, chances are that that is a muddy um, area. You could collect a little bit, try fermenting it and, and use any strong tannin and see if you get a, a reaction. It's a lot of fun. One of the um, people that was in the class found iron rich mud in upstate New York and got a beautiful shade. So it is out there. Iron is the most common mineral on the, earth, on the uh, earth's surface. So you should be able to find some sort of iron uh, deposit somewhere. Okay, so, um, this is a picture of what cherry ops extract looks like. It looks a lot like kutch to me. Uh, I didn't smell it, but um, kutch has a really sweet sugary smell. I didn't know if, if cherry ops did as well, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. And in fact, it was called Borneo kutch for the longest time because uh, most of the, the mangrove um, production of cherry ops was done on Borneo and it looked like kutch to people. And so they called it Borneo kutch and it was used extensively in the leather tanning industry. And Borneo kutch was like the, was the principal export from Brunei. So the kingdom of Brunei um, before oil was discovered. So that's where it came from. Uh, once they did, when they found oil, then, you know, mangrove harvesting and um, plantations were not that much of a thing, but it was the center for the cherry ops production for a long time. Um, the color difference between kutch and cherry ops is that cherry ops is just so much darker than kutch and much, much redder. So kutch can be anywhere from kind of a light golden brown to sort of a medium dark brown. But in order to get really dark kutch shades, it's, it's a, it takes a lot of dye. Um, cherry ops, it looks like takes less dye um, it's a different dye technique, um, and it maybe it's the one month of um, aging that really helps develop the color. And perhaps if we aged our kutch for a month, we would also get a similar color, but I've never aged kutch for a month, but we'll find out. Someday we'll find out about this. And this is, of course, the Cherry Ops that's um, fabric that's drying here at the Threads of Life Dye Studio. All right, so um, I just kind of wanted to speak a little bit that, you know, we're in such a unique time, I guess is the nicest way of putting it. Everyone is kind of going crazy because we're being whiplash between, you know, trying to fight COVID and return to our normal lives and um, do the things that we love to do without, you know, inadvertently uh, endangering others. And there are communities all over the world that can really use our help. And one of the things that I I'm happy that we're doing is that we are able to offer this dye stuff to you to give to try out. But it also helps villagers um, in like this particular cherry option, Papua, so New Guinea. But, um, you know, it does come from Borneo, it does come from other areas. And um, we're really happy that there's an FSC certified place where we could actually procure this dye because otherwise it's not being harvested as sustainably as we would like. And, you know, because of the overall um, threatened mangrove situation, it, it does make it difficult to use this dye, but we still want to be able to support people. So this is the best of this needle that we have to thread in order to try to be as sustainable as possible, yet also support traditional communities worldwide. Um, Threads of Life has always had that as their philosophy, which I think 
it makes it so admirable. They are asking people to do what they have always done traditionally. They are, of course, bringing on the environmental awareness component to that. But as many of us uh, are aware, most indigenous and traditional cultures already have such a deep understanding of environmental impacts that kind of they're really teaching us. We're not really teaching them but they are always keeping that to the forefront because those of us who are consuming this product, who are outside of these traditional organizations and communities, um, we just need to make sure that what we're doing isn't inadvertently harming others. So that's kind of where we're walking with this, but I'm very, very excited about the color. Uh, and I really hope that you get to experiment with it. Um, we will, we have it here, we're just packaging it now. And so we're planning to ship it on the week of the 16th uh, and you'll get it then. And uh, along with some, um, some very detailed instructions and um, yeah, I'll give you links to where to find some copper or if you have copper um, hanging around how to use it. And then uh, would love to kind of see you share what your experience with Cherry Ops has, has been. Um, I'm going to pause this, uh, stop presenting, okay, and stop sharing. I'm going to show you two things. The first is that this is um, the Cherry Ops. And as you can see, it's um, a gray day in Seattle, so it's a little difficult. But as you can see, it is, a, it is a deep, 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 almost matter red brown. Um, it's a little bit browner than matter, but it's not that. And the depth of shade, of course, is just incredible, right? I mean, like how many dips did this take? Um, and this piece itself is a tradition. It's available on the Threads of Life website. It's called um, Jarit or Yarit, I don't know. Um, but it is a, a traditional textile that is worn in villages and it's hand spun cotton and hand woven, of course. And um, there's, a very, there's a very small amount of cotton being produced in Indonesia. And this is from that particular area. So Amy, we can, Amy can link to it in, in chat, but um, they have it in, I believe they have it in a yellow, which I don't know what the dye is. It, it almost looks like jackfruit, but it might be something different. Uh, they have it in the Cherry Ops, and they also have it in this amazing indigo, which I also got uh, because it was so beautiful. And then this is um, mud dyed. So this is what mud looks like. So this would, let's see if I can, this is a bit of an eye dazzler, which I think is so amazing. Um, the piece, it's from Sulawesi, and I don't remember the name. It starts with an M, um, like Mori Lotong, Mori Mo. Anyway, I don't want to butcher it too much. But it's a um, ceremonial piece that's used uh, as a wall piece. And as you can see, it's an extremely dark brown black. It's not like processed black, but it is a very beautiful dark. And it's got definitely got a brownish undertone. And this is mud and cherry ops combined. So this is the tannin iron um, reaction that we talk about a lot when we're talking about mineral mud or when we're talking about making black, um, historical blacks from Europe. This is the way that black was created in uh, the village uh, environment. So that's my presentation. And um, Amy's gonna open it up for questions. And then, um, yeah, I hope that you guys get the opportunity to experiment with. Uh, Amy, the chat is still disabled. That's what I was asking. I just, I'm like, can you guys see my messages in here? So hold on a minute. I'm not sure why it's doing that. We can see yours, but mine says chat disabled. Huh. Wow. Kathy, I, do you see that? Like it says, cause I, it says everyone uh, can, can ask questions. Everyone who can see everyone, your messages. Everyone and anyone directly. Oh, try it now. Can you chat? Just somebody just write hi in there if they if you can. It still oh. says disabled, at least for me. 
Hold on. Mine says chat is disabled. Sorry, All right. guys. All right. We're what? trying to figure out like how to. But I can see your message. Oh, wait. Participant can chat with everyone and anyone directly, it says. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, we... Must have upgraded Zoom. Okay, you guys, you're just gonna have to raise. Can can? They is did. it possible right. to raise, raise do a the hand? hand raising? Here, let's do that. I'm gonna. Hold on. Okay, wait just a minute. We're looking at participants. Okay, hold on. Can if you guys can hit the um, do you, there's like a little. Hi, hand. Erica. Go for oh. it. Oh gosh! All right, I see all the hands now. <laughs> Erica, unmute yourself. Where are you? I uh, my chat's disabled. Also, I know. Did you have a question? No, I was just oh, raising okay. my hand. Yeah, we we can't get the chat to work. I think it's because Zoom just upgraded like a couple days ago, and sometimes if everybody isn't on the same, but I upgraded. It told me to. Yeah, so I, did, I don't know. But, yeah. yeah. Damn this thing. All right. Ah, okay, hello. Amy. How about, okay, how about Bonnie Nash? Do you have a question that you can unmute yourself? No, but I was just in the thing because you said raise a hand, so I raised a hand for you. Well, uh, <laughs> thanks, all right, hold on. Looks right. like Ma Mana, Mana. Did you want to ask a question? Hi, uh, question. Uh, okay. Can you tell us more about using the washing water from the rice? Oh, sure. Uh, fermentation. So, and you know, when you're. That was great. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, when you have polished rice and before you cook it, you yeah. wash it, right? Yeah, yeah, and then you pour good. off that milky water. Yeah. That water is starchy. Yeah. And starch makes sugar and sugar causes fermentation. So okay. you can save that water and use it and mix it with mud and it'll start to ferment. Okay. Do you know if it works for indigo fermentation vats as well? I don't to... think it reduces. It yeah. might. You could try it. I'll try it anyway, you know. Yeah. You know, I'll I try mean, it. it the thing is, is that the sugar might not be the um, right type of sugar in order to reduce and, and capture yeah. the oxygen. I don't know. I'm thinking because we use, uh, use madder roots. Yeah. The, the kind of envelope from the right. rice, uh, wheat, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think instead of the wheat, maybe using the rice water. You, never you know. could use rice water. You could also use the rice bran, the cover. You yeah. Could use that rice too. Bran. That's yeah. what we use sometimes. Yeah. Where, are you, where are you located? France. In France, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, I'm just going to go across the top from what I see. And it could be that you just put your hand up just because you're trying to help us. But Katie Smith, do you have a question? I do. Thank you so very much, Kathy. Um, my question is, is some of the dyes that take multiple dips tend to darken over time? Do you uh -huh. know if dye darkens over time or if it lightens over time? So lots of stuff with tannin in it, heavy tannin. Um, uh, dyes will darken. And so like with, I've noticed with Osage and Fustic, you know, that if you dye it freshly dyed and then Cabracho, if you take any of those and you, it's freshly dyed and you put it in the sun, you get this brownish weird cast all over it. And so I know you can manipulate that to make, oh, low battery, uh, amazing <laughs> effects. Um, and what they say about Cherry Ops is to not expose it. OK, so it must mean that you get you definitely will get a, a shade difference, but I don't know what it is. It might get a little bit too um, brown or maybe it goes, you know, maybe it goes a color that they don't find desirable. So that that could be an experimentation experimentation to see what happens when it's in strong sunlight. Sounds like a great experiment. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Kathy, I have the garbage man. Usually you have the leaf blower, but let's let that go by. Okay, Kathy Green, do you have a I, I am, excuse me, I have more of a comment than a question. I'm absolutely thrilled to know there's another 
economic value for um, mangrove wetlands because 20 years ago when bamboo got very trendy as a building product and I'm a house builder for 40 years, um, I was cringing because I couldn't believe it was a green product that had to be shipped six, you know, you know, halfway around the world. And they were ripping out mangroves to build mm -hmm. bamboo um, plantations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really glad that there's a sustainable economic value like this dye. And I still think bamboo is evil, though, even though I have one or two bamboo bowls in my house and I cringed every time I had to do bamboo cabinets or bamboo flooring because I think it's a hypocritical green product but it, that's just me. a lot of these are super tough to kind of thread the needle of what you know where our thresholds are I mean to me mangroves are kind of borderline right just because there's wholesale just destruction worldwide and there's only a few FSC certified um you know companies I mean, there's more, I would say there's more and it's growing, but uh, palm oil, of course, is just <laughs> unmentionable. <Yeah. laughs> All right, let's keep going with questions. Okay, Leslie, Thank you, Leslie's, Leslie's actually holding her hand up. What, where did she go? Leslie? All right, you could, yeah, unmute. We can't hear you. Okay. There, there we go. Okay. I wanted to know how and where you store this Coryopsis. Some can be stored outside, some can be stored inside, some has to go in the freezer. Um, no, they, I mean, it? it's, so this is Indonesia, right? Where the instructions are coming from. So I would say that um, room temperature, not in the sun, in the shade, you know, okay. uh, but if you have extreme temperatures like freezing, then you probably want to keep it at room temperature. And I think you could just put it in like a, a plastic container with a lid on it and just date it and be aware that you need to kind of look at it every once in a while. What about canning jars? Uh, I, I don't know how much this thing ferments. So if you had a canning jar that has like that little um, thing that <laughs> like when you make sauerkraut, <laughs> that allows gas to come out, I think yeah. it would be fine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Nancy Nakamoto, did you have a question? Oh, maybe Nancy's not unmuting. Okay. No, I, I just raised my hand, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's a cute little emoji I'm getting to look at. I'm going to lower that. Okay. How about Michelle? Yes. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the oil you mentioned to reduce the mold. Uh, I, I don't oh, care. any kind of oil. essential oil that they use for preserving, such as thyme oil, T H Y M E, um, oregano oil, uh, tea tree oil. Uh, mm -hmm. clove oil, those are all kind of used sort of mm -hmm. historically to um, reduce mold, but I would just kind of watch it, you know, if it, if it looks like it's not, maybe, you know, it might have just its own inherent antimicrobial properties. I, I just don't know enough about the dye. Super, that helps a lot. Thank you so much for answering. You're welcome. Me. All right, Gail Trotter, are you there? Where? Hi. Um, I was wondering about uh, impacts of the copper on like silks and wools or protein or is, do you think there'd be any impact from that or? I don't think so. I think it's such a small residual amount that you're using in order to um, develop the color. You know, you're not using, it's, it's probably just a fraction of a percent because it's, it's such a small piece of copper. Um, and I've never heard of copper being as corrosive as iron, but I don't know, but maybe someone who's a historical dyer has more information on that. Thanks. Uh-huh. All right. Helen Kennedy, come on down. You're the well, next contestant. There, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so I don't, um, I just have a couple of comments. Copper is really easy to find. It's, it's your plumbing in your house, probably. Um, there's lots of scrap around. Um, 
But I just looked up mangroves to see what was growing in the United States. It's a different species. Mm. And it's in fact considered, it's what is what protects the Gulf Coast from mm-hmm. the hurricanes. Mm-hmm. But the black mangrove that they're planting right now in Louisiana is considered invasive. So there's a lot of different species of mangrove. So, and then I looked up this specific species and it's a protected tree in South Africa. Yes. So, it's on so, the IUCN, but it's of least concern. So it's still allowed, you know, okay. still allowed harvesting. And with the FSC certification, it's the most, uh, it's the most regulated harvesting that's happening for this particular species. Right. right. So I was just, I'll be getting some when I see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Is it next week? No, oh it's in, it's two weeks. It's two Helen, weeks. Sorry. I almost <laughs> fainted right here on the air. Me too. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Right here on the air. <laughs> I'll see you in two weeks and I'll get some. Yeah, I'm that'd be great. Curious. Okay, I'm going to start a pot and maybe we could kind of like just see what it's Ooh, doing. Oh, yeah, let's do yeah, that. Let, let's. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Heidi, you better come up. Okay, uh, Melissa Brown. Hello. Um, Hello. Thanks. Thanks for this and all of the feedback Fridays for the last year and a half. It's been <laughs> wonderful. It's the first time I've been able to say that live. So, but oh, I just wanted you. to mention, um, I bought one of the uh, Sayuts from Threads of Life when they had their trunk show a couple weeks ago. They shipped it so promptly and it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It's with the Seriops. Yeah. And it's, it's got the macrame edge. It's just breathtaking and the color is beautiful it's everything you're saying it is yeah so I just wanted to contribute that and say thanks for promoting this it's a it's a lovely cause and a lovely product yeah so, thank you thank you yeah they they're they're kind of they're really 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 considering all the impacts before they kind of make a move so it's great oh. Very special. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, Deanna <laughs> scared me. <laughs> <laughs> Deanna, I had a couple of, a couple of questions. One, I I don't know if I heard the weight of fiber right. Did I hear eighteen percent? Well, that's what they said, but it's it's basically they just dip until they get the color they want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the second thing kind of relates to what was just being talked about. I got this really cool cushion cover from oh, nice. Threads of Life. Ooh. Do you think this? Yes. Mm. Yes, it right. is. Cool. Because they, yeah. they really only talked about the indigo, which, which is the back piece, yeah. which is beautiful, I have to yeah. say. And but you can always email them, it. take a picture of it and email them and just ask them for more info and they will give you more info. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, no, no more hands are up, Kathy. And I think All it's right. And just as you were trying to, you know, be, have this amount of time, because I know you have a okay, wait a minute. Joan Harrison just just raised her hand. Yeah, I just thought if there was time, a quick question. Do you know if if um this can be used to make a lake pigment as well? Hmm. I don't know, but I don't see why it wouldn't. Because uh, I've been, since, since I started coming, and I think the first time I showed up, it was a lake pigment episode. I've been making lake pigments daily, and I've taken over the kitchen, and I'm eating out because <laughs> I can't use my kitchen. <laughs> and, um, and some things are not working. Some things are easy, and some things are not working. And I so I, like, I didn't know if there's, um, or maybe I just, some things need a different ratio of acid no some stuff just doesn't like um like if you've ever tried to make a lake pigment from saxon blue doesn't work doesn't work okay it'll be interesting such a beautiful color i actually just tried to put in a big order i'm in canada so i'm waiting to get a post office box so that it doesn't cost 60 dollars in shipping (laughs) oh yeah get it get a u.s post office box and then they have to let us in yeah oh right or maybe you yeah yeah Uh, and then I know uh, you guys are much be- in much better shape than we are. We are, but I'm actually considering taking a job on Cape Cod. So look out. What? Oh, yeah. Great. 
Joan. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Nicole. Anyone else? Last call. Last call for. Oh. Elaine. Oh, Elaine. 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 Oh, Elaine. Where did Elaine go? Oh, there. there's Elaine. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't have a question. I'm just excited. I want to, of course, do this on Sally's Brown French Terry or some of oh. her. I'm just thinking maybe the tannin on tannins is because I've been looking for something that goes more towards a chocolatey brown. Uh huh. But like in that reddish. So, uh huh. Oh well, God. you could do it today with Kutch. I mean, if you dyed her, um, any of her, like her coyote cottons with Kutch and then added a tiny bit of iron, you'll go chocolate for sure. Okay. That And that goes with sort of a natural colored um, hemp, you know, like a, or a dark gray brown linen, kind of those things. Yeah. Any of those sort of dark natural colors. Cool. All right. I have yes, a question. If you have time. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hi. Karine is my name. Hello from UK. Um, uh, the textile behind me here is from Borneo and it's an ikat. And I thought it was Menkudu dye. That was my understanding. I don't know if you can see the color mm -hmm. of, of the brown. I don't know whether it has another name or is it I think that's Morinda. I don't think it's uh, Cherry Ops. So Morinda is the root where they like, they'll do like 30 or 40 or 50 applications to get a super, it's a brick red. It's a little bit different from this. This is browner okay. than that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But I think that's Marinda. That's pretty spectacular. That piece mm. yeah. That is beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you for your talk as well. Oh, thank you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Raise your hand if you think Kathy should do more of these. No. Yeah. <laughs> See, Kathy? Ah. All right. I just want to wrap it up, Amy. Okay. Wrap, da, it, da, up. Da, 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 wrap da, it up. Wrap it up. Okay. Da, 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 so da, da, da. Um, just a few reminders. We've got um, both Natalie Stopka and Sasha Durr's workshops up. We will be uh, posting uh, rust dyeing with Samantha Verone. So if you are in love with this rust brown color, that's a different way to get it. Um, we also are going to have uh, a an community indigo dip here in Seattle with Eileen Fisher. And so that is Sunday that I think it's the 22nd yep. um, at Eileen Fisher Renew in on uh, uh, Columbia City. And that's on uh, South Rainier Avenue. Um, you should come. It's a lot of fun. We'll be there. Um, as well as what else is going on? Uh, I'm just trying to think. OK, that's it. Oh, we just got our restock, part of our restock from 1111, those beautiful Ooh. Kala cotton fabrics. I haven't even opened the boxes, so I don't quite know what's there. But I believe we have not only the dark indigo, which was the hand spun, hand woven indigo, but we also have, um, I believe it's the same fabric, but I have to look at it first in a lighter indigo. So we have a dark blue and a, a light blue. Um, we have more chambray. Um, and we have more of the cotton lawn, which was that beautiful, very, very lightweight, uh, as well as the lightweight and then some of the midweight. So that will be here soon. And we are going to return on August 20th. And our guest that day is going to be the amazing Takayuki Ishii. He's joining us from uh, just outside of Tokyo. I have uh, one of my team is actually, and it's not me, is uh, bilingual Japanese English. And so he'll be assisting, but, but Takasan is pretty good with English. So, I, you know, I think we'll be fine. It's really just more um, some of the technical terms that we might need some help with translating. But um, he has a new book out on indigo, indigo and his may, way of making skumo and traditional indigo dyeing, and we will be carrying it. It is an amazingly expensive book, but it is absolutely beautiful. I think Britt Bowles showed it a couple weeks ago when she did her after party talk, and um, we will have that. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll have it by the time that um, Taka is giving his his um, presentation. Sure. Otherwise, we can you guys can pre-order it as well. Okay, and that is it for Feedback Friday. Yes. 
And we'll figure out what's up with the chat and why that didn't work. Yeah, that's that really was odd. Super interesting. Yes. All right, I'm running away. It's ten o'clock. Okay. Bye, Bye guys. guys. Gonna unmute. Say goodbye and hi. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank, Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye. Some of Bye. you in a couple of weeks. Bye, Kathy. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Okay, it was great. Care. Great. Excellent. Excellent. All right. All right.